Thank you, everybody. Um, happy to, to be the last speaker uh, today. So, I, as, as, uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, hello, is it further? Uh, I'll speak today about one of the investigations, uh, the recent investigations of forensic architecture, uh, which is a group um, of architects and artists and scholars uh, based in London at Goldsmiths um, that undertake something that we call counter forensic uh, practices or forensics. And in fact, just to say that forensic architecture, the term itself, refers to the work of building surveyors. So somehow, uh, for us, building survey is a certain entry point into unpacking histories of violence. Um, forensic architecture presents work in a variety of uh, forums, both uh, uh, something that we do often is prepare prosecution files um, in international trials, but we also present in, uh, in, in different forums, some, some of them uh, political and in human rights or for the UN, uh, etc. Uh, when, when we say counter forensics is what we mean is that we work, um, if forensics is the work of the state in, in a way that they police and monitor uh, citizens or non-citizens uh, of the state, counter forensics is the inversion of this gaze. It's citizens looking uh, at the state. Um, the, the investigation that I will today speak about is one that we have just um, recently released uh, about the Gaza War of 2014. In fact, what we've done is to analyze one day uh, in the Gaza War. Um, it took us a year to reconstruct using uh, dozens of testimonies of Palestinians of um, testimonies of Israeli soldiers, whistleblowers from an organization called Breaking the Silence, uh, hundreds of uh, recorded user-generated videos, thousands of images, etc., to reconstruct something of what happened uh, during that day. Um, it is our choice to concentrate of, of one day is, and on this particular day, uh, is to do not only with the fact that it was the deadliest uh, day in the Gaza conflict, but also because um, there was some, something of an inversion of the logic of contemporary warfare that, that interested us in it. Uh, in a sense, I think that most of forensic architecture work is both very specific, kind of a microanalysis of situations from which we try to understand, and in this case we're talking about a day in the war, to understand in what world can that day exist. And uh, so by looking at the micro-specificity of the incident, we're trying to reconstruct the broader uh, logics of violence that uh, was undertaken uh, in it. Another thing that is worth mentioning well, before starting to, to tell you about that day, or what we have discovered about this day almost hour by hour, is to say that this uh, recent conflict in Gaza happened in a very different juridical, technological, and political space than the others. Uh, obviously, uh, you know that in April 2014, several months before the outbreak of the war, um, the Palestinian uh, governments authorized or signed the Rome Status that uh, meant that the International Criminal Court in The Hague had jurisdiction over Palestine. It also meant that, um, and that being a call that was supported across the board by all uh, Palestinian uh, civil society groups and NGOs, that the war was understood as an evidence production space. And uh, given also a new technological reality in which it existed, um, we were facing with a situation that although human rights groups, amnesty and forensic architecture included, were not allowed to go into the war itself, 
uh, there were uh, hundreds and thousands of um, uh, new, those testimonies that come from and uploaded on social media that were uh, continuously produced. So the production of evidence and the, and the unfolding of, uh, of war, of violence during that day were entangled. Right? I mean, people were actually sometimes going towards violence, photographing, risking their life, and uploading it in the understanding that as the war was happening, a certain evidence file was being compiled uh, against Israel, and that the choice of the Palestinian civil society of shifting away from negotiation to the juridical domain implied a, a kind of a break in the political options and in, the kind of in their own definition of... Uh, of political possibilities. So what we, what we were seeing during the days is, is mainly material like that. Um, we were asked to, um, to reconstruct, in fact, in as much uh, detail as, as we could, uh, what was going on this day. And we were harvesting those thousands of images uh, from, the, from the internet, but very often those arrived without the metadata intact. That is, um, the two most important thing about uh, reconstruction of an event is to know where and when each one of the videos uh, were taken. Uh, but by the time this material has arrived in sites like Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, etc., the metadata was no longer in the file itself. What we needed to do was that in the absence of, fi of digital time, reconstruct time physically from the image in order to kind of recompose what otherwise is just a sort of thunderstorm of material that uh, does not necessarily uh, add clarity to, uh, to the situation. This is something that we call the image complex. The image complex is um, it's sort of a relation of working with images that does no longer kind of try to look at one photojournalistic shot or uh, um, one image kind of to see a certain evidence in it, this is rarely the case, but to compose a relation, sort of an image cloud between those thousands of sources. And in this architecture provides a certain uh, optical device because it allows you, architectural models allow you to locate in space and time those images and make sense uh, out of them. So the day actually uh, began rather optimistically after four, almost four weeks of war. Uh, in the morning, uh, at eight o'clock, August 1st, a ceasefire was declared, 72 hours uh, humanitarian ceasefire. It was supposed to commence at eight o'clock in the morning. So the roads were full of people. Everybody was returning home to see the, the state of their house and uh, see what what belonging they could salvage around the same time. And there is a controversy about precisely what time it was. Uh, a group of Israeli soldiers patrolling in that area fell upon an ambush of Hamas fighters, right? In that building uh, over there. In fact, uh, they have reached beyond um, the kind of the ceasefire line. Uh, it was the last tunnel, you know that the Israeli army went into Gaza to find tunnels. Uh, it was the one tunnel that was not yet um, uh, discovered. Um, a firefight happened around this particular building and um, two Israeli soldiers uh, were killed. One Palestinian fighter was killed and one Israeli uh, officer was taken into the, into the subsoil and kind of disappeared into a very kind of complex and extensive networks of tunnels that run underneath, particularly underneath that part of Gaza, the south of Gaza, um, uh, around the Rafa, uh, the city of Rafa. What happened at this moment became the hinge of that day and what, uh, what interested us. Uh, the IDF unleashed perhaps the most controversial command in their command book, a command called the Hannibal Directive. Uh, the history of the Hannibal Directive is really the history of Israel's struggle with Palestinian uh, organizations. Uh, as you know, one of the most um, 
known and, and useful tactics that Palestinian uh, organizations were using were to capture, at the beginning, Israeli civilians in airplanes, in other places, and to force the Israeli government into recognizing them, so into recognizing them as a negotiation partner in order to free that civilian or that group of civilian and to trade them for Palestinian or other um, fighters uh, at the time. Those fighters were not getting a POW status. They were not treated as prisoners of war. Uh, there was hardly any chance of releasing them other, uh, in any other way. Therefore, capture of a civilian, and later after the Lebanon War, after 82, a capture of a soldier became a way to open negotiations. Right? So that was a kind of a very... Um, but after the shift of capturing shifted from civilians to, milit to, to soldiers uh, in the Israeli occupation of Lebanon, the military slowly started to understand that it must not negotiate for their soldiers. Sometimes they did, and very controversially so, in the Israeli society, and uh, released thousands of, or hundreds of Palestinian prisoners for one or, or several individual soldiers, the idea was that there is a possibility to actually kill that soldier that was captured in order to avoid negotiation and avoid exchange. So what happened at a particular moment when Hannibal is declared is a certain kind of inversion. Those people that capture the soldier would protect the life of the soldier. The Israeli army would start hunting that person. And hanging in the balance would be, say, 1,000 Palestinian prisoners whose risk need to be measured against the act of killing one of our own, right? And in between, of course, those, uh, the captured person and the military are civilians. Um, so there's various calculation, the calculation of proportionality, how many civilians could be killed, the calculation of the prisoners, the life of the soldier, all enter into a kind of a, a, a sort of a necro economy uh, that, that defined, in fact, that day uh, of the war and kind of was um, the interesting, we, we have chosen that, th that case because we knew that bringing that to the ICC where uh, now, we, in fact, we are working with them on that is bringing a case that is a bit uh, in which the categories are inverted, right? In which the, uh, the Palestinian civil society groups bringing that petition are also petitioning for the right of the soldier uh, himself, right? So there's a kind of an inversion that, that allows us to enter into a combination of politics, law, and warfare in a very different way. So what, what uh, the work technically um, required a, a sort of a timing and locating of many images. When you have the metadata intact, you would know that this bomb has fallen at, I, I cannot see now the, the time, 10 something, and you know that that form of a cloud is at that time, and whenever you'd see that smoke cloud again, you would know what time it is. Um, most other um, uh, material that we got has in fact arrived without the metadata. This is a very, uh, this is the, the deadliest the bombing, uh, in fact, during that day. Uh, taken, what you see in, in, in STEM here is the, uh, the resistance media um, channels. And um, what we're trying to do here is to, in fact, establish the time of that, of this attack uh, by looking at, um, at physical clocks within it. So, sorry, I, I think I wanted to show you, yes, a second before the videographer shuts off the camera, uh, there are two shadow lines that are given. And those sh two shadow lines of two upright columns allows one to start looking at that, um, uh, to, to build a, a 3D model and to construct the scene uh, as if it was a sundial 
uh, while reconstructing the um, uh, well, well, yeah, while well reconstructing the time. Here you see uh, we adjusting the parallax distortion on the camera. Here is the architectural model that you would uh, uh, you could run. You can simulate the sun movement on it and match uh, the time of, of the attack. Um, so we know that this happened at 10.53. Now we are, we are building a kind of a, just a very, very simple uh, two-point perspective uh, a way of corroborating that the time, everything that, that we do has to go through this kind of process of corroboration um, and um, we managed to kind of to establish that the problem is that a lot of the material that we were getting looked uh, very much like that, in which the shadows that you were getting are very low resolution, and therefore the time resolution on the image also is uh, becoming um, necessarily uh, imprecise. So time resolution is what is the margin of time error that you can establish on an image, and in a situation like that, that was about 45 minutes, and we were effectively trying uh, very hard to, um, to work with those shadows, uh, but we were unable to, to sink the battle until we were realizing really that we are looking at the wrong part of the image. Um, we are, almost every photograph in that war had about a third of sky and two thirds of the city. And in fact, the sky, every time a sky was photographed, there was a smoke plume in the sky. And at some point we started understanding that we were looking at the wrong side. We had to look at the sky and in fact start understanding the architecture of the clouds in order to reconstruct um, the time of the day. So the smoke plume became some kind of physical clocks uh, with which we were working. And I will show you later how the clouds themselves became the metadata that allowed us to unpack uh, what was going on during this day. So for example, if you see that particular morphology of a smoke plume, every smoke plume is like uh, a fingerprint. It's unique in time and space. It never repeats itself. It depended on too many variables, meteorological variable, and the size of the bomb, what it hits, uh, etc. But you can start creating cloud atlases, and this is what we were doing. And for example, looking very much at um, footage that was sent to us by ambulances from, uh, from Rafa, so the medical service, uh, when, they were, when, when the uh, telecommunications stopped operating during that conflict, uh, the ambulances were navigating towards smoke plumes. So smoke plumes were always at the perspectival point of, of every image. Um, and uh, it was very useful to get those because we could start comparing them to other images. For example, here you see from the ambulance, the, the, um, which had a kind of a, a smartphone at the, uh, on the dashboard, uh, and you see exactly that this cloud is that, this is that, and this is that cloud. But you see here that the distance between those smoke clouds is different. Therefore, we're looking at them at a different direction. And you can start working backwards from the form of the cloud, from changes in the form of the cloud to recreate not only the time, but the space of what is happening. In fact, I have to admit that this work, I mean, the kind of the shift from the earth to the sky occurred when we heard the talk about an art historian, a 19th century art historian called Ruskin with his Cloud Appreciation Society. Um, <laughs> So sometimes being in a university could be useful, and if somebody thinks that <laughs> art, art history is completely without any use, um, this, is, uh, this is something that kind of helped us really somehow uh, understand uh, that, of course, for Ruskin clouds in um, it, it, one of his last essays is about clouds, the storm clouds of the 19th century, it's a text that kind of speaks about a new meteorology, about the cloud as a product not only of the weather, but in fact the cloud holding labor relation and exploitation, etc. cetera, um, in, in the 19th century. And we started realizing that something else uh, was 
also happening here. Um, the cloud, the smoke cloud that comes out of the place where a bomb happens is in fact a building in gas form. What happens after a building gets pulverized, where a bomb falls, is that all the material in it becomes dust. So it's composed of about 90% of concrete and about 8% of plaster and single digit percent of wood and cloth and human body and whatever is in the human body collect and mix together rises in a kind of uh, a column of smoke until it gets to a point where it pressures evens up and it opens like an umbrella or a mushroom and start raining down and all that process takes eight minutes so whenever you see a cloud in a particular point you know roughly how long after the actual moment where the bomb collapsed uh, you are. So uh, it's a kind of, if you like, soft architecture in the air versus the hard architecture of the ruins, soft and temporary architecture. That cloud continuously morphs, and it morphs, it becomes a diagram of its environment, right? It becomes that kind of key from which you can, you can reconstruct uh, the situation. Um, so for example, you would have, uh, we, would, we would find cloud and move from one to the other. Another, it's the first map I'm showing you of the place where, we, where this one day unfolded. Rafa is in a kind of triangle of border between Israel and Egypt. And it's also sitting on a very um, brittle sand soil very different than the soil of the rest of the Gaza Strip. And because it was a border town divided in two between Egypt and, uh, and the Gaza Strip, it's the place where tunneling has developed. In fact, all tunnelers in Gaza are coming from Rafa. And uh, it is really the, the space underneath Rafa is perforated with tunnel, with a very extensive network of tunnels that does not exist uh, in other places. Another thing that helped us open up the um, temporal spatial uh, relation during that day is that there was a visit, um, a very rare visit, by du exactly during, in the middle of the battle by, by a satellite, by a European satellite. And it's important that it is a European satellite because American satellites have an agreement with Israel that they reduce the resolution uh, of the images to an extent by which you cannot see neither people, buildings, or cars, right? But the Europeans are not regulated by those bilateral uh, agreement. And this one shot is incredibly unique because it contains smoke clouds in it. And we have the precise metadata on the satellite of the time uh, that it moved. So this is just a demonstration of the kind of pixelated uh, difference that I will skip. So, so working very, very patiently with the architecture of the cloud, uh, clouds is, is about pulling, for example, from the internet this sequence um, in which you could see that it had metadata on it, but the metadata is wrong because it says quarter to midnight, and that's not how quarter to midnight looks like uh, in our region. But the distance, the time distances between those images are consistent. So we know there's three seconds between that and then five seconds, etc. So we can plot a sort of time panorama and looking very carefully at, at, at the forms of the clouds, etc. And then we were trying to look at this one cloud that was caught in a satellite image, the one that was caught in plan. Could we see it in elevation? Could we see it in... Um, from, from ground level. So again here, uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a bomb that fell very close to the, to the photographer uh, at this moment. And you see here the kind of that plotting. And um, here you see that, uh, that satellite image uh, with the metadata telling us that we're at 1139. And, um, and we're trying to look for that precise cloud in it. So we, we're finding the location where the photographer, in fact, the photographer later, we, we were able to contact that photographer, told us the location. And we could see precisely that same bomb in plan and in elevation, therefore 
we are able to ground the sequence of time uh, within, within that um, day. So here is the exact moment when the elevation and the plan coincide on this kind of continuously morphing architecture. And then this is for us like the Rosetta Stone because every, every, every cloud shape has a time and now every time we would see on any other photograph those clouds, we could know exactly what time they are. Here we're pulling out something else from the internet and we're seeing that it has the same hairline uh, on, on the camera, so this is part of the same sequence. Uh, we establish the time on this sequence so we can put it here again, you'd see the same hairline uh, on, on this camera. So these are like just being drawn from different parts of the web and uh, being plotted on a timeline and in which you can start building up and triangulating uh, these strikes. Now you'd see the, the, the video from the, um, of the ambulance and, and you can start seeing that while we sync up the clouds, we can start looking at the ground and, and start organizing the kind of the history. This is really like a work of a historian, I suppose, no? Of, of one day uh, with a historical method being work with these kind of uh, digital medias, uh, et cetera. So the time became very important because what we needed to show and what we were trying to, to articulate in the time-space relation is, as I will show you later, a relation between three strata. What's happening in the sky, those plumes? What was happening on the earth, the testimonies, uh, the fate of people on the ground, the, the, the destruction and death? And what was happening in the architecture of the subsoil and how to compose those three uh, layers together? So this is another video that shows you the way we treat clouds as metadata. Um, now you'd see again this um, resistance video. This is, by the way, the, the deadliest strike in the day. 16 people died at that particular moment. Uh, we are comparing that form of the cloud to uh, these clouds that we see here. And uh, we are able to, uh, to sync the three videos and when we do that, when we do that, we are able to actually triangulate because we can turn the, the, the three-dimensional body of the cloud around and locate the exact point uh, of the strike and that is here visible in a kind of a before and after uh, image. When looking so carefully at the clouds, we realize that we actually see also another thing in the sky. And this is the kind of thing that you cannot see uh, in, in the eye. I mean, you need to really kind of work frame by frame uh, if you want to see um, if you want to see these things. The bombs, uh, a fragment of a second before they're falling. So this is, these are the bombs that killed uh, those people. What you see here is an attempt to locate this um, frame where we froze the, the bomb in mid-flight inside a photographic plane, locating the photographic plane inside an architectural model that uh, would allow you to, in fact, uh, measure and locate the exact make and manufacture of that bomb so that civil claims could be made against the uh, manufacturers. So uh, you would see here, this is the, the bombs themselves caught there very distinctly, very large bombs. This is an American manufactured uh, one-ton bomb, and that is currently going to, to litigation on, uh, on, that, on that basis. When I said architecture operates as a viewing, as an optical device, it is really the only way to make sense of this, um, of the massive relation between images is locate them within an architectural model. We crowdsourced that architectural model. It was built by architects in Gaza, uh, by architects in China, by architects with us. Um, it operated as a, as a huge sundial 
to, to some time, time the images, but as an optical device to see the relation, the time-space relation um, between the images uh, so that every picture frame could actually start to be located and the city becomes uh, an archive uh, of sorts. Okay, I, I, could, I know that uh, time is short, so I'm gonna really now run through things. But you could see really how the sort of the, the relation between the architecture and the, and the media that is shown. And, and you see here that the smoke plumes become like the hinges of, of the narrative, because it is around them that we can turn and start seeing different events uh, as they're happening and reconstruct the kind of the architecture of destruction through the architecture of the clouds. Okay, I'm gonna skip some things here so that we move, um, well, just very briefly, this is a way in which we were able to reconstruct also the pathways of tanks through uh, somebody working in NASA that kind of works on uh, a sensor on satellites that monitors vegetation health for agriculture. And what happened was that when tanks are going over agricultural fields, they, they destroy uh, the plants, they stop carbon sequestration, and you know a path of this, these tanks is kind of registered very clearly. Again, something you cannot see with the naked eye, but is a, a kind of a cunning sort of uh, repurposing of, of things that showed us, for example, that these are in, 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 this is the border, this is the Gaza Strip, these are the Israeli kibbutzim on the other side of the wall, and you see how um, the Israeli army left from the civilian settlement. So when Israel is claiming that the Palestinian is using uh, their citizens as human shields, that becomes a very material kind of counter-argument. I mean, they, they left uh, from these uh, settlements uh, themselves. Okay, let me run f forward um, into the subsoil. To reconstruct the architecture of the ground and the air is an optical exercise. To understand what happened, to try to understand whether a manhunt and a kind of a killing of their own soldiers taken place there, we needed to, under to understand the invisible architecture of the subsoil. That also is something we did not want to do because we did not want to perform uh, for the Israelis any kind of service of uncovering where the tunnels were. What we wanted to show, so wherever we, we actually got information inadvertently or realized where the tunnels were going, we withheld it, but we were showing where the Israelis thought tunnels were. So that was important. Are the clouds hanging over the places where they thought, right, the soldier is taken into the ground, they, they try to reconstruct the architecture of the subsoil, they bomb, and we wanted to see if the bombing, if the architecture of the sky and the subsoil coincide here. So this is again the place where the capture took place. So for us, their intention, where they think the tunnel is, is in fact the hinge on which this case operates. Uh, and that would be discovered through traces of digging uh, that they've done after the conflict itself. So here is the place where the firefight happened. This is the place, this is that place a day before the firefight. This is during the firefight. And now look at the same place. This is how it looks like after it. It's complete erasure uh, of it. But while zooming into the area, we can actually see the rabbit hole disappearing into the ground. So we have a starting point. We have the starting point of where the Israelis think the tunnel is. And then we're following now their digging. We're following their diggers. They went in and they start to try to dig that person out. So we start locating the places of digging on a map. And here is already Palestinian kind of, we're fencing that area so that people would not fall into the holes that they were making. Another thing that was very interesting, and I don't really have much time to speak about it, is that at that chase, at that manhunt, that operated there, one Israeli soldier actually went with a small group into the tunnels, um, and in fact, that person got a medal. Because he got a medal, the, the, the account of the chase was made, put in a public domain, and we could compare it with uh, what we were finding. So for example, he said he was walking 300 meters and arriving at a T-junction, that's the T-junction, uh, finding all sorts of things, uh, etc. 
And now we are trying to look at where the tunnels ended, where, where they were going to. Here you see um, a, a military base, and you can see here already the same traces of digging that the Israeli bulldozers, when entering, were trying to dig into the ground. Here we are in a zoom into that area. This is the deep excavation. And if you ask what happened, so this is after the event, during the day, all these are bomb craters. I, they are not trying to save this guy. In fact, wherever they think that person is, bombs are following into those holes. This kind of what directs that violence during that day is, is this manhunt. Uh, another, and so, so look, so this is kind of places where you see it. If you look at it during the war, exactly where the fire um, has, uh, has fallen. So um, you see all those kind of here, all those excavation points uh, with the with the architecture of the tunnel as the Israeli military was imagining it to be, whereas, uh, and all of a sudden we realize that that place where we froze the bomb with the American manufactured one ton bomb hanging in the air is exactly on the same line of excavation. And we were, by timing them and timing the movement, and again, this is something I, I do not really have time now to, to go into, but it's exactly the same time when that bomb is falling, these 17 pixels caught in a kind of 125th of a second, we believe is one of the bombs that were aimed at uh, the killing of the captured soldier. Thank you.